The ECOWAS Court of Justice holds an external court session in Accra, Ghana. The panel is constituted of three judges from different countries in the region. It is a hybrid sitting. Some applicants and their legal counsels put in physical appearance, but other counsels appear before the court virtually. Dorothy Freye Ansa, Chief State Attorney, for the sixth defendant. They make their oral submissions. There are simultaneous translation into the three community languages, Portuguese, French and English. The judges deliver their judgments. All the proceedings are streamed in real time. It is a seamless process. This is the contemporary face of the ECOWAS Court of Justice. It is the culmination of its evolution over 20 years as the principal judicial organ of the community. The ECOWAS Court of Justice was first conceived under the May 28, 1975 Lagos Treaty, which established the 15-member Economic Community of West African States ECOWAS for the economic integration of the region. The treaty made provision for a tribunal of the community to ensure the observance of law and justice in the interpretation of the provisions of the treaty. It was also to settle disputes that may be referred to it in accordance with Article 56 of the Treaty. However, this was not given effect. In 1991, ECOWAS heads of states and governments adopted a protocol establishing the court as an interstate court and the principal legal organ of the community. Still, the court did not take off. In 1993, the revised ECOWAS Treaty was adopted replacing the initial Lagos Treaty. Article 6 and 15 of the revised treaty established a court of justice of the community. Its territorial jurisdiction covered the 15 ECOWAS member states. However, it was not until December 2000 that the pioneer judges were appointed to the court. They were seven in number. The pioneer judges were sworn into office on the 30th of January 2001 in Bamako, Mali, 20 years after the court was created. The judges appointed uh, Justice Tav and uh, myself as the vice president and president of the Equals Court of Justice. And at that time we were in Mali. We didn't know where the court would be. But the then president of Mali said the temporary court will be in Abuja. And because we did not know what arrangements have been made, the judges, seven of us, mandated me, since I was from Nigeria, and then the first president, or the founding president, mandated me to come back to Abuja and see how I would set up and then invite all of them to come so that we'll commence work. So when we met with the president of Nigeria, President Lushego of Asanjo, he said there was no accommodation yet for the court and all the judges. But they are going to give us a temporary place in Lagos. That is the Senate building in Lagos and where to stay. 
The temporary seat of the court was located here at the old National Assembly building within the Tafawa Baliwa complex in Lagos, Nigeria. The pioneer judges drew up the draft rules of procedure for the court at their second seminar in Lagos. It was essentially anchored on the rules of procedure of the International Court of Justice as well as the Court of Justice of the European Communities with some modifications. À Lagos, nous avons passé banalement un mois. Mais on a sorti ce que nous appelons le règlement intérieur, le règlement de procédure. Officers from member states were invited to look at the draft of uh, the rules of procedure to see whether they are in consonance with what they perceived the rules to be. The 25th session of ECWA's Heads of State and Authority, also held in December 2001 in Dakar, Senegal, decided that the seat of the Community Court of Justice should be located in the Federal Capital Territory of Nigeria. In January 2002, the court consequently moved from its temporary location in Lagos to its permanent seat in Abuja. When we came back from Lagos, we're still in a temporary office in the ECOWAS Commission until Nigeria could get a place. On the 15th of July 2002, the court moved to this complex. Elements of the requisite court bureaucracy were emplaced and some critical court infrastructure installed. The ECOWAS Council of Ministers approved the rules of procedure for the court on the 28th of August 2002 to facilitate its operation. The year 2002 therefore marked the crystallization of the court from a concept to a physical reality. The court was now set to begin business. However, there were still more hurdles to overcome. The jurisdiction of the court as contained in the 1991 protocol on the court was rather narrow and restrictive. Article 76.2 of the revised ECOWAS Treaty expressly limited its mandate to disputes between ECOWAS member states or between member states and ECOWAS institutions on the interpretation or application of the treaty. It also stipulated that only a member state could initiate proceedings against another member state or institution of the community on behalf of its nationals. This meant that individuals could not approach the court directly with their grievances. Which member state was going to bring which member state before the court? Which institution was going to have the courage to bring a member state before the court? So we found out that virtually if we have to stay there like that, we will be there for the five years and nothing will be done. The court eventually held its inaugural sitting on 22nd January 2004. The first case in the history of the court was filed by Olajide Afolabi against the Nigerian government. The court did not waste time in uh, considering the application since it was the very first one coming before it, but ruled that Olajide Afolabi they don't have the local standard to come before it since individuals at that point in time do not have direct access to the court. The court was not seized with the powers to amend the protocol to cure the defect. The statutory power to amend rested with the powers that established it. Leaders of the West African Bar Association met with the management of the court to explore ways of making the court effective and functional. After the meeting, we came to the conclusion that we needed to mount a campaign for the expansion of the mandate of the court. We sat down, we discussed it at length among the judges and then found areas where we could ask for the mandate to be expanded. 
The ECOWAS Council of Ministers saw the light and acceded to the amendments with the adoption of the 2005 Supplementary Protocol in Accra, Ghana. The Supplementary Protocol expanded the jurisdiction of the court and conferred it with four mandates. The court now had the jurisdiction to determine cases of violations of human rights that occur in any ECOWAS member state. Individuals with any complaint of human rights violations against state actors were conferred with the legal right to approach the court directly. This was however contingent upon the fulfillment of two conditions that the application must not be anonymous and the matter must not be pending before another international court. An important provision unique to the court was also introduced stipulating that there was no requirement for an applicant to exhaust domestic remedies before filing an action before the court. Individuals did not therefore need to pursue judicial remedies within their national court system before bringing a claim to the ECOWAS Court of Justice. So, any violation can be brought timelessly before the Court of Justice. And I think we achieved by that amendment. This was a transformative moment in the history of the court. Its role and relevance in the judicial landscape of the region was profoundly impacted. Cases began to pour in from individuals, not member states now representing the individuals. However, the judges coming from the different legal systems in the three linguistic zones of ECOWAS, English, French and Portuguese still had to sort out how to work together. Finding some harmony would facilitate the common legal reasoning to enable them deliver on their judicial function. From 2005, the court now vested with the expanded jurisdiction came to life. There was a surge in judicial activities the human rights mandate immediately became the most popular. Individuals and corporate organizations across the region took to the court to seek judicial redress for human rights violations by member states. The years 2001 to 2005 constitute an important phase in the history of the court as the foundation years of the court. Creating awareness on the establishment of the court as the principal legal organ of the community was imperative. Intense sensitization was given priority to make the West African community aware of the mandate and powers of the court as well as how to access it. The sensitization program has now become a recurring feature on the court's annual calendar. It keeps the court in public consciousness and reminds the community of the judicial option in the conflict resolution spectrum. When we go to the countries, it is the grassroots, the market women, pressure groups, interest groups that we used to meet to educate them, let them know about the court, what the court does, the procedures, if you want to file a case, the kind of rights that they can bring before the court. Another critical initiative of the court is holding external sessions in member states. Article 26.2 of the 1991 protocol stipulates that where circumstances or facts of the case so demand, the court may decide to sit in the territory of another member state. Eu já não consigo ver a CDAO ser o seu tribunal de justiça, porque os cidadãos vêm respeitando cada vez mais o tribunal. Portanto, eu gostaria de ver o tribunal a continuar o seu trabalho e a continuar a granjear o respeito dos Estados-membros e também da comunidade jurídica que integra a CDL. The court held its first two external sessions in 2007 in Bamako, Mali, to hear the case of Musa Leo Keita and the Republic of Mali and delivered a landmark judgment which has become a legal precedent on the competence of the court. Another notable external session was held in 2008 in Niamey, Niger Republic. The court heard the now famous case filed by Hadijatu Mani Karau against the Republic of Niger over the practice of slavery in some communities in that country. Évidemment, le militant des droits de l'homme du monde entier, a commencé par la Fédération internationale des droits de l'homme. Tout le monde était venu. 
Et en une semaine, nous avons siégé. Et c'est ça aussi l'avantage de la Cour de justice de la CDAO. Il n'y a pas de frontières, même de langue. Parce que à Niamey, nous avons siégé, c'est une cour moderne de droit et tout ça. Nous sommes des francophones, mais les débats se sont déroulés aussi bien en français qu'en Aoussa et en Djebarban. Pour que tout le monde comprenne, parce que c'est toutes, toutes les femmes du Niger qui étaient intéressées. The Kadida Kest was a precursor of the, the right of citizens of ECOWAS from Niger to go and complain. Not only Niger, many of individuals have been encouraged by seeing the case of Kadija from Niger have been a success. The external sessions continue to be a critical part of the court's tradition. Over the years, the court has sat in Niamey in Niger Republic, Ouagadougou in Burkina Faso, Porto Novo in Benin Republic, Ibadan in Nigeria, Lome in Togo, Bissau, Guinea-Bissau, Bamako in Mali, Abidjan, Côte d'Ivoire, and Accra, Ghana. The external court section is one of the uh, core programs of the court. Even in the phase with the introduction of the electronic system at the court, it's still important that the people feel the presence of the court uh, in, in, in person. And so that program is still re was relevant yesterday and is still relevant today. Launching the legal year is another prominent feature on its annual calendar. It provides an annual platform to review the judicial activities of the court and its programs for the year. Of the legal year of the ECOWAS Court of Justice. In 2020, however, the court could not abide by this tradition. The coronavirus pandemic struck and the whole world momentarily came to a standstill. This would prove to be another watershed in the history of the court. For the first time since it commenced intense judicial activities in 2005, the court could not sit for an extended period of six months. It took judicial notice of the pandemic and adjourned all proceedings sine die, but access to justice had to be sustained in the interest of litigants. The court turned to technology and adopted a virtual court system to keep the wheel of justice turning. This has facilitated the development and introduction of the Electronic Case Management System, ECMS. Today, if you want to file a case, you get on your computer and then you file a case. So we wanted to make that accessible to the citizens from wherever they are, as long as they meet the requirement to interact with the court. So you can even find, hire a lawyer just to prepare the documentation for you. If he does it, you are good to go. But once you file it, it gets to us, the respond, respondent will be served electronically. He also responds, and the matter is ready for hearing. If it's ready for hearing, you sit in the comfort of your room, your house, you log onto the system, you, so somebody can, file a case, get judgments. The ECMS has radically changed the way the ECOWAS Court of Justice operates. It's a hybrid hearing, so you could decide to come. My name is Inkem Akolam Okoro. I represent the applicants in this matter. May it please my Lord. Merci beaucoup pour la présentation. It enabled uh, more access to justice because previously to be a litigant before the court, you need to be able to afford the expense of traveling to the court. But with the new practice directive, you can appear from the comfort of you know, your house, the comfort of your office. I think it's really made uh, the ECOWAS court, it's brought the ECOWAS court to the doorsteps of litigants, yes. In 2017, the ECOWAS commission undertook reforms which affected all its institutions. It led to a paradigm shift at the court the number of judges was reduced from seven to five. Their tenure was also reduced from five years renewable to four years non-renewable. With the ever-rising cause list of the court, this was always going to be tough on the court, but it has been resilient. The ECOWAS court has attracted litigants for its relatively easy access, unique procedure, innovativeness, 
as well as its courageous interpretation and application of the treaty, text, and relevant statutes. ECOA does not have its own catalogue of rights. So the courts have been very innovative, innovative in deciding on the catalogue of rights it should apply. The court applies the treaty, conventions, protocols and regulations adopted by the community as well as general principles of law. It is equally guided by international instruments and human rights ratified by the state or states who are party to a case. The court has itself gradually set in place its own jurisprudence in terms of the human rights that has evolved over all the years. The court in certain cases even declare and maybe say, comment about the legislation in some of the member states that these are not in line with international standards or the treaties that they themselves have, have signed on to. The court held in the case of Musa Leo Keita and Republic of Mali in 2007 that simply closing a claim with an allegation of human rights made it necessary for the court to act pursuant to Article 9 fall of the supplementary protocol. The Community Court of Justice, in line with its reasoning, has entertained 446 cases in the first 20 years of its existence. The litigants at the court have been as diverse as the nature of cases brought before it with respect to a broad spectrum on human rights. I viens devant la cour depuis 2015. Ordinairement, il est difficile quand le gouvernement est impliqué d'obtenir euh, une décision juste, une décision équitable devant les juridictions nationales. Du coup, la cour de la CDAO est demeurée depuis presque 20 ans déjà le seul recours pour ceux qui sentent leurs droits violés, leurs droits humains violés, de les voir au moins entendus, même si ce n'est pas totalement indemnisé ou écouté, justifié, de les voir au moins entendus, de, de s'exprimer si vous voulez qu'on dise comme ça. Overall, I think the ECOWAS Court is setting the standards um, with respect to how uh, international human rights courts should operate. Um, the court has been able to render decisions in average two to three years, uh, and some of those decisions have been great, uh, expanding you know, the, the frontiers of human rights jurisprudence. As at its 20th anniversary, many of the 233 judgments delivered by the court have become major legal precedents in the community. The court was the first uh, human rights court in Africa to apply the Maputo Protocol in the Njemanze case. Uh, the court was the first human rights tribunal in Africa to uh, rule on a case of domestic violence and what the role of the state is in responding to victims of domestic violence. No, one of them was about the right to education in Nigeria. And um, I remember that very well that um, the, the Nigerian Attorney General, they, they, they seriously opposed that case because they felt it was against the Nigeria federal government, federal constitution of Nigeria. But then we looked at the African Charter on Human and People's Rights and declared that it's a right which every citizen must enjoy. You see, so that decision on the right to education cuts across is it, the entire sub-region. I don't have to actualize the legislation where it violated the principle of liberty electoral, that all the citizens could participate in elections free. A citizen recorreu and we, effectively, uh, condenamos o Estado e pedimos ao Estado que produza uma outra legislação uh, onde todos os cidadãos possam participar livremente em eleições. Lembro-me dessa situação. The court has been honored by Columbia University in the United States of America with the Columbia Global Freedom of Expression Prize for the judgment in the case filed by Amnesty International Togo and seven others against the government of Togo. This was over the shutting down of internet services in that country during anti-government protests in 2017. The ECOWAS Court of Justice in its decision in 2020 
declared that the shutting down of internet access by the state of Togo violated the rights of the applicants to freedom of expression. However, the challenge the court has faced is with enforcement. Only about 30% of these judgments have been enforced by member states. The protocol says the court of justice is a final court. You cannot appeal from its decision. So with that in the protocol, signed by all the member states, we can see how a member state will refuse to execute because they gave their sovereignty, part of their sovereignty, to sign that treaty. And when, when you have given part of your sovereignty, you have to go by the agreement. Ironically, some of the presidents that declined to enforce the decisions of the court while they were in office have now turned to the court out of office to seek the court's intervention over alleged violation of their own rights. Overall, the jury is out on the performance of the court as it commemorates its 20th anniversary. It has really set the standards. Uh, amongst the um, international human rights organizations as one uh, that is seen to be progressive in its um, interpretation of the statutes. De ver o tribunal a continuar o seu trabalho e a continuar a garantir o respeito dos Estados-membros e também da comunidade jurídica que integra a CNEL. As Chief Justice, I have seen the East African court operate, I've seen SADC operate and one uniqueness I think we have here is that in this court there's no need to exhaust local remedies and that gives relevance to this court. From 2001 to 2021 the court has been delivering on this mandate to the West African community. As it enters a new decade the court is also looking towards making more history by extending its role on the judicial landscape of West Africa. Now we see the, the cry of the citizens. Now they, are, they know more about the court. They are pushing for more cases to be filed. If they, we have two panels for the cases to improve, and then also the appellate court to test the judgment of the court, that will be a very star of Africa. <laughs>